Uh, all right, so, <coughs> let's get started. So last time we covered generators. As a review for a generator, our model of a generator is a voltage source, right? This is some ideal voltage source. Connect to a synchronous reactance, this is some XS. Then the rest of this is connected to the grid. So this is to we'll connect this to the grid. And uh, the, the thing is, when you connect this generator to the grid, it's hard to say where the power generated by the generator actually goes to. Right? So it flows into the system, then the power flows all around the system and gets to the load. And it's important to remember that we never have a generator directly, so we very, very rarely have generators directly connect to the loads. Most of the time, is the generator connects to the grid, then the grid, after some transmission lines, and we get to the load. So you will see some examples saying a generator connect to a load uh, supplying such, you know, so much power. That's not a very common situation. So the more common situation is you have a small generator, for example, going into this sort of big grid, and you have different loads. He's supplying different loads. Okay. So the model will take for this generator connect to the grid as a following. We'll think of this as a voltage source. That's my generator. That's connected to a synchronous reactance. Okay. Synchronous reactance. Then it's connected to another voltage source where this is the grid. And the model does the ideal voltage source. Okay. Ideal voltage source. So the grid to us is some basically is some terminal that has constant voltage. That's the model we'll have for the grid. Okay. And this turns out to be the, the more useful model than generator connect directly to the load. So later, we'll do, uh, in a few classes, we'll do calculations when, you when the grid is more explicit. But for now, for, from a generator's perspective, you can think of the generator just looking at a voltage source, okay? A very stiff voltage source. So basically, this grid, this is called an infinite bus. Infinite bus. It's called an infinite bus because it says this voltage source will hold its voltage at a constant value, no matter what your generator does. Okay, the generator can generate whatever power reactive, active reactive power it wants, but the grid being very large will hold it, okay, but will hold its voltage at a constant magnitude. Okay, constant magnitude. Okay, so then if you look at the circuit model, if the grid is an infinite bus, meaning a perfect voltage source, then it's often easier to take the grid as a reference point. Okay, so when we talk about, so now if we want to do active reactive power calculations, well, look at how much power is generated from the generator and flows into the grid. It's often easier to think of the grid being voltage at angle zero. It will reference everything to the grid or the terminal voltage. Then the generator will have some angle delta. And basically, we want to understand how does the act power and reactive power depend on you know, delta, E, V, and delta. So any questions about this model? Okay, so see, right, so this is a little bit different than before. Right before when we did, for example, the per unit analysis, we often take the generator, the source to be the reference voltage, have that as angle zero, then computed all the other angles in the system re reference to that source. But for the generator analysis, the convention is to take the infinite bus, to take the grid, the angle zero, and reference everything to that end. 
Okay, so that's a different convention we have. Okay. And uh, the reason we take the grid as angle zero is all the generators connect to the grid. Right, so instead of having, you know, looking at each system individually, it's easier just to say the grid has some angle and nothing is angle zero. Okay. So if we do the active power calculations, for example, let's see what happens when we do this calculation. So the complex power is P plus JQ. This is E times, so the phaser times the voltage phaser times the current phaser. So this is the power generated by the generator. Okay. This is the how much power the generator generates. This is voltage times the angle. So the angle, the complex angle is the voltage difference divided by the synchronous reactance in the system. So if you do this calculation, this is E angle delta minus V angle zero J excess. Okay, so we can reduce this. We can reduce this a bit more. So thus we can put the J into on top, for example, this becomes e to the angle minus delta minus 90 degrees minus v angle minus 90 degrees over xx. So that's just uh, uh, putting the j upstairs. So we can continue to, then we can multiply. So what we can do now is we can take e multiplied by i star so after this multiplication, this is E angle delta times E angle minus delta plus 90 degrees minus V angle 90 degrees XS. Okay, so we put everything in here, put everything in here, we get EV. angle 90 degrees minus delta minus V squared angle 90 degrees over XS. Okay. And we want to figure out basically what is the real part, what is the imaginary part. So if you do this, if you take the real part of this thing, you get the familiar equation we had before. This is P equals to EV over xs sine of the angle delta. Okay, so if you do this calculation, you basically recover sine angle. E times v over the synchronous reactance times the angle, the sine of the power angle. And this was the same as the transmission line. This was exactly the same the equation we got by looking at the, how much power can transmit from one end to the other end of the transmission line. Whereas this, the transmission line here, as the reactants excess, right? So if you just multiply this through, we get this number. So if you look at this equation, you recover these. Wait, hold on. Okay. So, so this is P is EV excess sine delta. So this is the important equation. This is the active power equation we have for the system. And if you look at this curve, you re we recover the same curve as before, right? This is active power curve depending on the angle uh, between the generator voltage and the terminal voltage. Okay? And the maximum occurs at angle 90 degrees or power over T, and the P max is E times V over XS. So it's a very simple equation. So if you recall, Think back to the transmission line example. Which side do we want to operate on? Do we want to operate to the left of power over two, or do we operate on the right of power over two? To the left. To the left, right? For stability reasons, we want to stay on the left. So this is the operating region. Okay. 
Okay. And that's why for generators, we always have a, and this is basically in some case, give us a maximum power the generator can output because you're sending power to the grid, but you have to send it at an angle, probably uh, a bit less than 90 degrees. Okay. You have to send it at an angle a bit less than 90 degrees. So when you operate, you have to make sure you operate on the left of pi over two. Okay. If you get too close and if you go to the other side of the end, uh, the other side of this curve, then it's not stable anymore. And then it goes for bad things happen. Okay. So it will damage your generator, you have to do emergency shutdown, this kind of thing. And stay on the left of this. So, but if then if you look at this equation, P equals E V over XS times sine delta. What are the ways that I can increase the maximum power transfer? Let's say my generator, I say I have a you know, very large generator. I'm not limited by the fuel I have, right? So I have, you know, I have a large steam generator. I can pump in more mechanical power. But let's say I'm limited by this stability condition, right? By this angle condition. And now I want to squeeze more out of this generator. How do I do that? Okay, right, so the chat says, you know, two ways. I can increase E, decrease excess. So both are the ways we can do this. So how do I increase E? Let's say I want to increase P max. When does increase E? How do I do that? How do I increase E? Does E not have to match the voltage of the infinite bus? No. They need not match the infinite bus. Okay. They need not match, right? They are normally fairly close to each other. As we all see, if they're not that close, you have reactive power problems. But they don't have to be exactly the same, right? So the way to increase E is increase your exciter current. So your exciter current basically will pump up this uh, voltage E. Okay, so that's one way to do it. But there's a limit to that because your core essentially after a while stop responding to that. Okay, so there's upper limit to the how much E you can increase. Another way is decrease XS. How do I decrease XS? So the way to, so XS, right? So capacitance, right? So that's one way. So remember XS is internal to the generator, right? It comes out because we model the generator as a synchronous, as a voltage source behind the reactors. There is not a physical inductance inside the generator per se you can get to. So this normally is a generator design issue. And after you design the generator XS, it is what it is. So one way is to cancel this out by attaching a capacitance in series. That's normally hard to do for large synchronous generators. So XS, sometimes you cannot get rid of. The place you'll see capacitance being used for this generator is for wind turbines. Sometimes you see when you have wind turbines, we do attach capacitance, try to cancel out some of this series reactants. You will see this in wind turbines. But also as an announcement, so uh, wind energy 451, 551 is offered next quarter and uh, I'll be teaching it. So I got the assignment, I, I got assignment yesterday and uh, I will, I'll be teaching that course. So Professor Kirshen was supposed to teach that course. He, he could, there's some type conflict with him in the winter quarter. So uh, there, uh, we were gonna cancel the course but there were some, there's, I guess, a lot of demand for the course. So I'll be uh, teaching it. Okay, so I got drafted to teach that course. So if you're interested in wind energy, uh, you know, welcome to take 451 or even grad student, you can take the 551 version. It's the same class. You can take, you can register for 551. Uh, in that class, basically we'll go into design wind turbines and uh, we'll turn out wind turbines is not so different from synchronous generation, basically it's a big synchronous generator with fancy power electronics around it. Okay, that's, that's what wind turbines boils down to. And then for that class, we'll look at a lot of, you know, 
uncertainties. So we'll cover more than just wind. We'll cover solar. We'll cover storage. We'll cover integration. Okay, so that's the interesting. That that's a classic. Okay. Uh, just uh, some my mind because I got an email saying, "Hey, you you're teaching the class." So, <laughs> uh, quite happy with that. But uh, so if you want to know more, take that class. Okay. Uh, you see sort of fancy power electronics ways of uh, dealing with synchronous reactants in that class. Okay. So this is active power angle, active uh, power angle curve. And uh, it's a sine curve and uh, it's the same thing, you have a stability limit. Okay. So often it's not limited by the amount of field you have. Sometimes this, but sometimes it's just the stability. You can't operate too close to power two. So we can also look at reactive power generated by this, right? So we look at the react power generation. Let's say, so instead of looking at the real part, we can look at the imaginary part of the S. So this is the imaginary part of EI star. So if you do some calculation, what we'll have is this is EV XS cosine delta minus V squared over XS. So this is what we have for reactive power. And again, there's no reason this, so this may be positive or negative, depending on how exactly the parameters works out for those equations. And uh, this also means that your generator it's not always generating reactive power. Often it's absorbing reactive power, depending on the exact setup in the system. Okay. So this could be negative. When you do calculations, you got a negative number. Don't worry too much about it. It happens. And this answers the question from before that, what happens when E is very far from V? So if you look at this equation, when E is much smaller than V, basically you're dumping a lot of reactive power into the generator. So if the generator can absorb this, that's fine. But normally you want E to be fairly similar to V because you don't want a very negative reactive power term coming out. Okay. So, but if you look at reactive power and active power, active, okay. yeah, go ahead. What well, means the I, like the, the I am imaginary current times the E times I star, I mean, Oh, this is the imaginary part of E times I star, right? Oh, imaginary part of the... Okay. Yeah, so I am as the imaginary part, R E is the real part. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, S as P plus J Q, this is real part of S, that's J. Oh, I am imaginary, it's not like the current. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah this is the imaginary part. This is the imaginary part of the uh, complex number, yeah. Yeah, so if you look at this thing, so if you look at this reactive power, is it very sensitive to angle? Is it sensitive to the angle? Right, so it turns out this reactive power is not very sensitive to the angle. It's much more sensitive to the voltage. Right? If you look at this equation, for example, dq, d delta, this is ev xs minus excess sine delta. And this is roughly small for delta small, right? So delta is not that large. Delta is much smaller than pi over two anyways. So for a you know, reasonable range of delta, the reactive power is not very sensitive to the angle. So that's why you hear often that reactive power depends on voltage. It's because the dependence on angle just small because of the cosine of a small angle. Okay, so a small changing angle does not show up in reactive power. It's much more dependent on the voltage because you have voltage square in this equation. Okay, so that's a reactive power equation. But don't worry too much about this. We worry sort of less about Q than P. Any questions about this? Um, you mentioned that you don't want a negative reactive power injection. Is there a reason for that? Um, uh, so you don't want it to be really big, right? It can be negative. What you don't want is to say E as an order of magnitude smaller than V. Then the V squared term dominance. So what happens when you have a large reactive power is you have this transmission line, right? You have, you know, 
this grid. If it's sending a lot of reactive power back to the generator, it's using up a lot of the line. Right? If you think of the line flow, it basically sort of this I square term limits line flow. So if that's taking up a lot of reactive power, that creates problems. And your generator has to absorb this reactive power. So you know this basically your generator, if it's very large, then your generator has to essentially act like a large inductor, and that can create problems. But so E is not very different than V, but a small negative number is fine. Yes, it does so as long as it's not too large. That's it. Right, so reactive basically generator can you know it can be positive or negative. That's uh, it happens, and basically what a generator does is want to absorb reactive power or generate reactive power. Basically, to keep the V, so it wants to keep the voltage roughly constant in the generator. It wants to keep the voltage roughly constant. So if you look at the limits. On generation, right? So, as we said, there's always a limit on active power generation, either coming from the amount of uh, fuel you have or the stability limit. And you have a maximum current your line can tolerate. Okay, so there's two things that limits how much P and Q you can output. One is P, you have a limit. Two is Q is more free. But your generator is basically pushing out current. And your lines have a current limit on this. So you don't want the current to be too large. So you have a P limit and the I limit. And what you have is basically a, this kind of circle. So the P limit gives you this line. And this comes from the I limit. Okay. So this is your PQ limit of generator. So when you operate, you basically have to operate within this semicircle. This is what your operating range for the generator looks like. Okay, so you're operating somewhere in this circle. You probably want to stay a little bit away from the boundary. So you're operating at the inside of this circle. So this comes from the current maximum state of current. So this is one limit. Another limit. So this is one limit. And uh, if you look at the semicircle, we, if we do calculation with this being the limit, then the optimization problem becomes really hard to solve. OK, so what we, what we don't like is when you solve for a generator's operation, if you have to limit P and Q within this semicircle, that becomes a very hard optimization problem. So often we don't like this sort of limit. So how do you make this limit easier? Right, so what is the approximation we actually use in practice? Right, so in practice, we don't use this semicircle. What we do, we'll replace this by a square, by a square. So in practice, what your software does as we'll take P and Q to be this sort of square. Now, this is a much easier description of the generator than the semicircle limit. So what this square tells you is P is less than some P max, okay, zero, bounded by zero. Q is less than some Q max, Q mu. Okay. So this is a, most often the constraints you'll see is we'll have a box constraint rather than a semicircle constraint. The semicircle constraints makes our life harder. The box constraint makes the software and all the calculations we do easier. Okay. So often you see this box inside a semicircle, although there is a little bit of wiggle room. There's some wiggle room if you have this kind of limits. So if you sort of intersect this box with a semicircle and uh, may, you know, fudge the boundary a little bit, basically each generator will have this region as supposed to operating. And if you, are, if you own a generator, you basically check whether you're operating this region or not. Okay. Well, you basically check the operating region. Any questions about the operating region for generating?
And this is sometimes, uh, so this sort of region is sometimes you just define, you just sort of draw, you just uh, pick a region basically. And often as the, it's up to the owner of the generator to pick their own region. So how the system works is if you own a generator, you tell the system operator, this is my PQ operating region. Then when the, then basically the gener the operator tells you the operating point and then making sure your operating point is within your own region. That's what the generate, that's what the system operator does. So any questions with generator? Generator models or settings. So you will see this sort of box uh, constraint a lot in the second half of the class. Second half class will spend some time dealing with this box constraints. Okay, we'll just work with box constraints. Nobody really works with this type of constraint just because it's sometimes it's even hard to describe what this region is analytically. So vast majority of time, the software and us will just use a box constraint. Okay, so this is a single generator model. You'll see some generator questions in the homework, but uh, uh, those are sort of simple circuit calculations. So next we'll go to large networks. Okay, next we'll get into a place where we'll replace this single generator, single load, or single generator, then the grid is infinite bus. We'll get into the notation we need we want to talk about a system with hundreds of generators and uh, thousands of nodes, things like this, okay? So we'll look at something called the large networks. And this is chapter 2.4 in the book. We should really think about this. This is basically matrix notation for power systems. Okay, we'll do matrix notations for our systems. Matrix notation is useful because it saves us a lot of effort. We write down things and we want to think about things. Okay. So this is for uh, convenience most of the time, mainly for convenience. But it is important to have a vector matrix idea in your mind rather than think about the sort of single component things in your mind. Okay, so this is an important uh, w different way of thinking about the system, right? So if you Look at people who work in power system analysis. What they think about system is basically a giant matrix with some vectors. That's the way we think about it. So that's what we'll cover in this. Okay. And also for this for this part, if you have questions, please ask. Because you don't want to get tripped up on the notation. Okay, the rest of the class will all be using this notation throughout. And then you get confused on the notation, then some of the materials become uh, very hard to understand. Uh, and often it's not a conceptual thing, it's just notation, there's error. So let's, you know, here we want to be careful and you guys let me know if something's confusing. Because I see this all the time. So this is natural for me, but this may be the first time some of you are seeing this notation. Okay, so let me know if something's confusing. Okay. So we're doing power system nodal analysis. This is because when the system have too many buses, uh, it's hard to talk about them individually. So we're gonna look at the entire system at once and not say some you know, multi-dimensional object. Okay. So we need power flow analysis. And uh, another reason why we need power flow analysis is if you think about the grid, right? Think about the grid. Often now what we talked about is generators will set their voltage that will determine the current flow, and that will determine the angle in the system. But if you think about the actual load, okay? so up until now, most of the load we cover in this class is some impedance. So is the actual load an impedance? Or what does the actual load actually look like? Okay, so important to think about what analysis we're doing and why this problem is hard. So right now, the, all the circuit with this is basically saying the load is some impedance, you know, computing, right? either compute the impedance value or the impedance given to you, compute the power absorbed by, the, by this load. But for actual load, if you look around you, 
look at all the things that's drawing electric power, how much of it is actually impedance load and how much is there some other type of load? So what is your computer? Let's so say your, your computer is plugging, you're drawing your computer consuming power. What type of load is your computer? Is it a constant impedance load? Look at your TV, look at your phone. Right? Is there a constant impedance? Does your phone look like a resistor to the grid? All right, so most load, so we have load is not really a constant impedance load. So we have load is constant power, right? Often your load is constant power. You plug in your computer into the, into the wall socket or draw whatever power rating is supposed to draw. Right, so it's not some inductor in parallel with a resistor in a capacitor. As says, I need, you know, 100 watt, I'm gonna draw 100 watt, okay? I don't care what voltage you're operating at, I don't care, you know, what current I'm drawing, I just want constant power. Same thing with any other electric load you have, electronic load you have, all of these are constant power. Okay? It's not, modeling the mass impedance really doesn't work. Right, so this is constant power. So if you look at your load as constant power, what does your generator do, right? Your generator, we model generators as the voltage source. That's really not how the generator is controlled because your generator essentially determines how much power they want to send to the grid. Okay, so load consumes power, your generator provides power. So you have generators, provide power. So really for the system, we want to talk about power flow, not so much current flow, okay? because no, nothing in the system demands a constant current. Most things demand constant power or some power and your generator does not work by generating a current. It generates some P and Q. Okay? So when we look at power flow analysis, most times it's because for a system, when we, up until now, when we think about circuits, we think about voltage and current, but really we want to get to a point to think about P and Q flowing the system. And the voltage and current and angles are in some sense implicit, defined by the P and Q. Okay, so our goal is trying to get to a place, instead of doing voltage, finding out the voltage, uh, looking at you know, given voltage finding power, what we want to do is we want to get to a point where we want to say, give power find voltage, we want to find inverse problem. I want to solve this problem, all right? So together, will take us a couple of lectures, but that's a goal. And to do that, to solve this kind of problem, really we want a looking at the whole system at once because power sort of spreads out all over the system. So we will look, we'll look at the entire system in a single, as a single entity. Okay, so no longer, you know, piece by piece, but as a single system, with this kind of power flow. Together, we'll go through many steps. We'll go through many steps. But uh, we'll, you know, so that's the goal after the, for the next two lectures. All right, so again, this slide is saying that the idea is we want to give power from voltage. That's a fundamentally hard problem. But with the, the, at the end of this course, Hopefully you have some tools to solve this problem. Okay, so the goal is given power, compute voltage. Okay, so up until now, all we're doing is given voltage compute power. We want to do the reverse the other way. Okay, use the other way. So the good news, the good news is the circuit is simple. This is RLC circuit, right? Once we reduce things to the pi model, all we have is RLC circuit. Okay, so that's the good news. There is also bad news associated with this. There's also some bad news associated with this. So the bad news one, uh, this is nonlinear. Okay. This becomes a nonlinear problem. 
because power is voltage squared. So given power from voltage as a hard, okay, is a hard problem. This is one bad news. The second bad news is this is large system. Okay. So we're looking at, you know, this number of buses or nodes. Okay. So, very, so we have to solve a nonlinear problem for a very large system. Right. And the rest of the class is giving us you know, some techniques to deal with this kind of problem. Okay. So how do I solve system nonlinear equations for a very large system. There are ways to do it, but uh, it's not uh, as simple as a linear problem. And uh, it's not as simple as, you know, calling a package, right? You need some, there's some art associated with solving this kind of problem. Right? So any questions up until now for the goal of this? Okay, so this is our goal. Right, so as, uh, as a check, so how many of you have seen nonlinear system, system equations? Right, so I'm assuming probably less than half of you have seen that. So, to, so we won't jump into that directly. So we'll do the linear system equations first. Right, we'll look at you know, voltage current, linear system equations. Then we'll look at nonlinear system equations. So our goal is by the again by the end it will be somewhat uh, familiar with this, right? Have some idea of this. Okay. So I guess the so it's not all bad news, right? It's all not all bad news. So this because power system, all these equations are, are nonlinear, creates a lot of job opportunities for us. <laughs> so we there's people doing research and uh, people working on this because precisely because these systems are hard to solve. Okay, so if you go and work for somebody like uh, GE or ABB in writing software, you know, each piece of software solving those kind of problems is you know, five, six million dollars. Right? And uh, you, you know, so uh, there's sort of a lot of interesting things coming out of this from looking at this nonlinear systems. So we will get to nonlinear equations. Uh, not yet, not yet. So we'll do the linear. System first. Okay, we'll look at linear system equations first. Then we'll look at nonlinear systems just to as a starting point. Okay. All right, so let's look at how we look at linear systems. So this is one example of a system. And we'll use this example to develop some uh, calculations, okay? So let's look, have some terminology here, okay? So you see this sort of horizontal dark lines over the place. If you look at the book or you look at any, some technical menu. So this is called a bus. Okay? This is sometimes called a node or this is called a bus. These uh, terminologies are used uh, you know, interchangeably in most places. So you can think of a bus as a point of connection in the system. Okay, a bus is really where multiple things come and connect together. It's for this bus, for example, this line, this line, and this line all come together and connect at this bus. Okay, so that's what we call a bus. Right? So this is. So you'll see, you know, you often see, you know, a bus in the system and so on. It just means a point where multiple things all come together to be connected. Okay. That's what we mean by a bus or a node. Okay, this is clear. Okay. Okay, so basically what bus does is everything connect to the same bus will have see the same voltage from the bus, right? So that's what we'll see. So why here? Y is the emittance of the line. Okay, why is the emittance of the line? Okay. So now we'll start to see Y more and more instead of Z. Okay, so from, you know, as this 
before most time we were doing calculations, we're doing things in terms of z, the impedance, we'll start seeing less and less of z and more and more of y, more and more y. So why is this, right? So, uh, so what's the reason of using emittance instead of impedance? Why not use z? Why do we use uh, the emittance instead of impedance? So everything with what we do now has this Y bus matrix. And this sort of Y matrix that we use have all these things. We rarely, when you talk large systems, right, you'll see Z, right? So the reason, the reason is, as the chat is correct, that as we care about multiplication instead of division. And this turns out it's useful, right? So if you look at Ohm's law, right? So Ohm's law says, I is V over Z, or V is Y times I, right? Oh, sorry, other way, I is Y times V. Okay. So we can call Y one over Z Y. And the nice thing for this is if you look at this circuit, are the buses in parallel or are the other in series? I have this Y, A, B, C, D, E, F. Are they all in parallel or are they in series to each other? It looks like parallel to me. Right, they're all in parallel. Everything is all in parallel. All these are in parallel. Right? Because they're in series, we can just add them, right? We'll just add them already. There's no, no need to individually look at things in series. But when you have multiple lines connecting different buses, all of these things are in parallel. Okay, all these things are in parallel. So when you have two things in parallel, let's say, okay, let's say this in parallel, you have Z1, Z2. The equivalent impedance is one over one over Z1 plus one over Z2, right? This is the calculation for equivalent impedance. This is a bad equation, okay? This has too many reciprocals in this. Okay, we don't like this equation because it has way too many reciprocals. Okay, I need to invert it and invert it again. So not easy to use. But if you look at things in parallel, this is Y1 and Y2, then the equivalent So what is Y equivalent when things are in parallel? For this, what is Y equivalent now? Right, just Y1 plus Y2. Much, much better looking equation. Okay, much, much better looking equation than impedance. Okay, so the reason we talk about emittance rather than impedance, as I want to get, I, when all these things are in parallel, I don't want to do all this sort of inversion things. Okay? I want to just add things together. Okay? Instead of you know, doing one over, adding, then doing this the one over thing again, okay? So emittance uh, just as notationally is so much more convenient than impedance. Okay? As, as equivalent, you can use impedance if you want. Everything we say can be done. In terms of z, the equation will just looks you know much worse, right? When you use y, it looks much cleaner. Okay, so from now on, when we see a large system, we will think of in terms of emittance rather than impedance. Any questions about this? Okay, so that's so let's look at our system again. Let's say how do we analyze this? Basically, analyzing the system meaning means the following thing, right? So for this system, we want we will say nodal analysis. What we want is we want to relate v to i. Okay, we want to relate v to i. We're relating v to i in vector form. Okay. Well, say so I have some voltage vector defined at each of the buses. I have some current 
injection at each of the buses. And to relate the vector, we, we want to relate them in vector form. And that's another analysis. Okay, and uh, this builds up the machinery we need when we eventually move on to power flow analysis. Okay, let's do, let's walk through this. So this will get a couple of times to get used to this. Okay, so, you know, may not be obvious the first time we see this, but we'll see this again and again, right? So hopefully we'll get more familiar with this, okay? So when we move on to look, talk about voltage, the first step is always to choose a reference voltage, right? Remember voltage is, when we talk about voltage, voltage is a relative measure between the potential, okay? It's a relative measure between the potential. So there's one voltage we can always take to be the reference or to be zero voltage. Okay, so we'll pick one this to be the reference voltage. Okay, so it took to be, uh, you can think of this as the graph. Okay, so often you can think of this as a graph. So we take pick this, this bus to be reference. Okay, so it doesn't matter which bus you pick, we'll pick this bus. Okay, so it's just June this way, draw, we'll pick this bus. Okay, so this one, this something we'll do. Pick a reference bus. Then what else can we, well, so what else can we do? Well, remember our goal is to build a vector. These are vectors, right? So I want to build them as vectors. So vectors have components. So V is actually V1, V2, and so on. I is I1, I2, so on. So when we talk about vectors, they have different components. So the next thing we do is actually to number the buses. Okay, so we'll assign labels or numbers to the bus. Okay, so we'll call this bus one, bus two, bus three, and bus four. Okay, so this numbering is arbitrary. I need to, we'll call this ground, this common reference bus zero. Right, so it's just a numbering of the buses. So we'll look at a component, We'll look at things like, you know, V1 as the voltage at bus one, V2 as the voltage at bus two and so on, right? We'll just number this way, okay. Any questions up until now? All right, so we'll go slow, but uh, just make sure that uh, what is clear what we mean by, you know, vector of current and the voltage, okay? When you're choosing your, um... Your reference voltage, yeah. which are you just gonna, you chose like the one on the bottom there, is that because that's where like the most of them met? Yeah, so, so it doesn't matter which one you pick, we just pick this one. Like we need to pick one, so we'll just, uh, it's, it's convenient we drew it, you know, from like vertically, so sure. just pick the bottom one as reference, but you can pick any other one if you want. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't. So in most of the questions you'll see, I will pick one for you because I don't want arbitrary numbering of buses and things like this. But in practice, you can, you know, you just, okay. historical reasons you pick one, that's a reference. Sounds good, thanks. Yeah. Are, the, are all these buses from the grid, so are they all the same voltage from the chat? No, so the buses can have different voltage, right? So this is our grid now. And in this grid, what we have is we have two current sources driving everything else in the grid. Okay. And they have, we have some emittance on the lines, we have some current sources. So our job is to figure out what voltage they're in. Okay. They, they may, they, they're not necessarily all the same voltage. Right? They may, the voltage may be close, but they're not the same. And our goal is to figure out what voltage they're actually in. And uh, to clarify this, as the point is, we're talking about the... Okay, so let's step back a point. Let's, st let's step back a little bit, right? So, Remember I said that we are given power and we want to find the voltage, right? Given power, our goal is from the power, let's find the voltage at the generators and at each buses. Why do I care about the voltage at each of the buses? Right? Why do I care about this? Right? Because I'm running a system, a generator generates some power, my load consumes some power. I mean, presumably they match, right? So generation minus loss equals the load then why bother doing this calculation to find figuring out the voltage at the buses? 
right? So I can build this circuit, right? If the circuit doesn't blow up, it's operating at some voltage, why do we care about finding the exact value of the voltages in the system? Okay, right, so, and the, and the reason is, the reason is, this is an important uh, point. The reason is the safety or the constraints in the grid are in terms of voltage, current, and angle, right? So when we offer the grid, we have some line, let's say uh, 300 kV line. We have a transformer that has a voltage rating. We want to make sure the voltage that actually happens in the grid as close to the rating. Okay, we want to make sure for reliability and safety reasons. If I design this transformer, let's say to go from 100 kV to 10 kV, I want to make sure this voltage, when I'm serving this load, is actually close to 100 kV. Okay, this is what I want to make sure. So when we support a load, I want to make sure there is a feasible set of voltages that can support this load. I mean, the voltage is within my design specification. Okay, so when I design the grid, I imagine all the voltage is as plus five, you know, plus minus five percent from the nominal value. I need to check this by solving this nodal analysis. Okay, I need to ch actually check this. And also remember, when we look at transmission line, we said the transmission line has a stability limit, right? We want the angle to be less than you know 90 degrees for sure, or less than 45, we want to be safe. But we don't know the angle until we do the calculation. Okay, so we're, we have some load pulling, demanding power. We want to make sure that I can serve this load reliably, safely, uh, within stability limits. To know this, I have to go back and compute the angle, the voltage magnitude, the current magnitude, and the angle, to make sure I'm safe. Okay, so the grid is, is interesting. Uh, the actual thing you want is power. For the safety, all the constraints, much of the constraints is given in terms of voltage, current, and angle. Okay, so you need to, given power, compute the voltage to check that we're operating safe, right? So this is why we need to check the voltage and current. Okay? Right, so this is what we need to do. Right? This is what makes this problem interesting. As a demand and the physical, physical state of the system is not directly the same. It would be much easier if every load said, oh, I want to be at five volts, right? That's a much easier question for us to answer, but that's not how the system do that. Everything wants power at the end of the day, but all the safety things are, you know, in terms of voltage, okay? And this is pretty much common to all electrical systems, where your system designed to work for a voltage range, but you're demanding in terms of power. Well, that's why we need to do the computation to find the voltage. Yeah, questions? Professor? Yeah. So so what else is like the safety, what else is gonna have safety ratings beyond like the transmission lines and the trans transformers themselves? Right, so the generators will have safety ratings. But generators, uh, normally the safety rating is on P and Q, on P. Right, so the common constraint we see is the, Voltage, right? The voltage magnitude limits on all the buses because this has to do with transformers. We'll see the, the line limits because that has to do with either stability constraint or the thermal constraint on the line. We'll see active and reactive power constraint on the generators. So these are sort of the big constraints we'll have in the system. Right? So it. all Thank this you. is designed to serve the load, right? So load is really does whatever the load wants. We don't constrain the load. So the constraints are everything else in the system. Okay, so any other questions about this? Okay, so if no questions, uh, let's break. Let's take a 10 minute break. Come back at 10.37. We'll walk through this example. We'll go through the rest of this example during KCL and KDL. Um, Professor, I had a quick question. Yeah. Go ahead. So I know someone asked you this on Monday. They're asking about um, the hyperbolic sign and not being able to do complex numbers in it. Right. And so on my calculator, 
and I remember she had like she had mentioned oh you got to be in radian mode and yeah. in complex mode right right and my calculator just will not do it for whatever reason I have like a TI-84 that has okay. complex mode and has radian mode and every time I try to do hyperbolic sine cosine or tangent it just work? tells me like it's just like error like variable okay. is like not defined or something like that yeah so uh, it, it, it's really, I don't know. I, I haven't seen a TN84 since high school, right? so I don't, I don't know <laughs> what it does. Yeah, I don't know what it looks like anymore. So, uh, I mean, I guess other people maybe have a solution, or you can use your computer. You can use Mala. Right? So, okay. What's under that? You can use. Yeah. So for the midterm and homework, you can use Mala if you want. It's, uh, right, no constraint. There's no constraint on the computer software you can use. You can use Google Calculator, and, and that works out for you. Whatever you want to use, you can use. Yeah. All right, thank you.
Okay, all right. So let's uh, continue with this example. Okay. So again, uh, just to for the midterm, right? To clarify, is you can use whatever technology is available to you. As long the only constraint is don't communicate with each other, but otherwise it's a free for all. Okay. So if your calculator doesn't work or you don't. Uh, you can use uh, Python or MATLAB to do calculation. Okay. You can Google stuff if you want to. I don't know how much help it will be, but uh, you know, you're know, you free. Feel free to use all the different technologies. Okay. Okay. All right. So when we continue, let's continue with this example. So we'll number the nodes. And the one reason for numbering the nodes is gives us a convention we're talking about current. Okay, so if you remember, when we talk about current, current has a direction, right? There's a direction with current flow. So we need to assign some direction to it, right? So either current is flowing, you know, from a node, so current has a flow from a node to another node. So when we assign the numbers, generally we take the convention that the current flows from a higher number from uh, flows from a lower number node to a higher number node. So in lexographic order, we'll look at current flow. Right? So we'll let's look at, for example, we'll tell this to be ID. Okay. So this is current flowing in line D, flowing from one to two, because one is uh, in ordering number ordering one is higher than two. Right? So one is in front of two. Okay? So flows from one to two. So IB flows this way, flows from two to three. This is IE. Okay, so all the, we have all these different current flows. Right, so this is IG. This is IA. This is IC. This is IF. Okay, so we'll flow from a lexographical order and everything goes to into zero. Okay, so that's uh, the convention of the current. Right, so we'll go from one to two, two to three. When this, the reference will go from three to zero. And when we have a current source, we'll respect the direction of the current source. Okay, so this is the direction of current flow. All right, so again, this doesn't, this is can be a sun average priority, but for simplicity, for convention wise, this is the convention we'll use. Okay, so it's lexographical order, right? So one to two, two to three, three to four, one to four, and so on. Okay, and then when you have a current source, that's whatever the direction the current source says it is. And then we talk about reference, we'll say it goes into the reference. So it goes into node zero, because we're thinking node zero as a ground. Okay, so this is the ordering of current. This is the direction of current flow. Okay, so after we, any questions for this? So like so all the nodes, like so the current from the, the bus one to two to three to four and the whole three and the four to the ground and to the zero. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so zero, we just say the current will flow into zero, just the convention like this. Yeah. This is, yeah, there's no, deep reason for that. So just, we need to pick a direction. You can pick arbitrarily if you want, but this is the direction we'll pick. Okay, so we'll do, well, so if you pick, so after picking this current, right? The goal, is, so we need an equation, right? Remember, all we want is, you know, voltage relating to current in a matrix equation. So the way to get it, so let's write KCL. Uh, each of the nodes. Okay, the goal is let's write Kirchhoff's current law as the node. Okay. Right, so we'll write KCL. So let's see. Let's do it for node one. Okay, it's for node one. Node one. Okay, so this node, this bus. You write a KCL, what does a KCL look like? So KCL says a net current into a node, in or out of node is zero. So if for I write KCL for this, what does the KCL look like? So 
Okay, so for this node, right? So we have, right? So our convention is, right? So current, remember, is flowing out of this node, right? Right. So the chat is correct. So, right? So for this direction, we basically have the current is flowing out of it. So I C plus I D plus I F. These are the only. Th these are the three currents flowing out of node one. They must add up to zero. Okay. So that's us see. KCL and no one. Okay. I just look at all the current associated with it, add them up, and it uh, has to equal to zero. Okay. So no two, let's look at no two. Okay. So no two has two current out, one current in. So our notation is IB flowing out, ID flowing in, IE flowing out, this is zero. Okay, this is our KCL for node two. How about node three? The node with a current source. So how do I write this for a node with a current source? Right, so let's look at all the nodes, right? So I have IA flowing out of the node minus IB because IB is into it minus IC because IC is also into the node. What does this equal to? Right, so this equals to I3, right? The, the source, okay? This is equal to the source, right? So this is the net outflow. This is the source. To be the negative I3 because the the flow into the node three. Right, but it's in the other side, right? It's in the right hand side of the equation. Right. So this equally um, can be written as IA minus IB minus IC minus I3 equals to zero. Right. So we're gonna move I3 to the right hand side. Right, thank you. Right. We're just moving I3 to the right hand side. Yeah. Yeah. So please if you have this kind of question, please ask, right? So there's a lot of this sort of plus minus notation convention things going on here. Okay, so, and uh, some of them uh, looks, you know, just more somewhat arbitrary assignment, but it's, it's a convention used all throughout the industry. Okay, so, okay, so then we've got node, node four. Now similar to node three, we have, let's see, so we have IE, Flowing in, so minus IE minus IF flowing in plus IG flowing out equals to I4, which is the current source I have on this bus. Right, so questions for this? Okay, so, right, so if you summarize the okay, KCL, so our goal of writing this way is on the Left hand side, so on the left hand side, we have the variables. Okay, so the variables we want to compute. If you look at this equation. On the right hand side, we have the sort of the constants. Okay. All right, so on the right hand side, we have the either sum up to zero or the current source. And on the left-hand side, these are the variable, the currents we want to solve for. Right? This is uh, the, for the branch current we have. Okay. All right, so know that we don't write, right? So we, we don't write an equation for the reference node because we, this, it turns out will be redundant to the other equations, will be linearly dependent to the other equations. Right, but by the virtue of setting this node to be reference, means that we can eliminate this node in when we write our equations. Okay. We can eliminate this. Okay. So this is Kirchhoff's curl law, right? So this gives us basically puts all the currents, the current injections, the current sources on one side. So next we'll use KVL to relay voltage to the current flow. Okay. Relay voltage to current flow. Right. So this is what we'll do. Right, so the next step is basically we have voltages 
in all the nodes or all the buses. Um, by Ohm's law, right, we can represent current flow as uh, voltage. Okay, so this gives us a way to relay voltage to current. So our Ohm's law, so next is our Ohm's law. So Ohm's law says, so let's look at, uh, so let's pick a current to take a look at. So let's look at, uh, so let's look at the elements for node one. Okay, so let's look at node one. Okay, so node one has current As I see, so let's be clear what no one has. So it has I C, I D, and I F. Okay. So I C, right? We want to write this as voltage. So for using emittance, this is Y C times V1 minus V3. Right? This is our equation. This is our equation for the current as a function of voltage. All right, so then what we have is we can do similar things. So we have ID is YD times V1 minus V2. IF is YF V1 minus V4. Okay. This is all the Right, this is all the equations we have. So what we can do is we can, so now we convert the branch current flow to voltage, right, to voltage. Right, so instead of writing IA, IB, IC, we're writing the voltage format. Okay, we're writing a voltage format. So this gives us the, right? So for example, no one we have is VC, V1 minus V3 plus YD, V1 minus V2 plus YF, V1 minus V4 equals to there. Okay. And uh, similarly, we can do it for the rest of the, we can do it for the rest of the buses. We can do it right for the rest of the node. Any questions with this? And uh, why this thing start for me? Okay. All right. So if you do this, we can express them all into this kind of equations. Okay. All right. So we're almost there. So this seems tedious, but uh, we're matching towards a finally going to a matrix. No, no, notation. So if you look at all these equations, okay, basically on the right hand side depends on V1, V2, V3, V4. Okay, right? Only depend on this for voltages. Everything else are constants are the line parameters we have. So we can reorganize these equations. Right? We can collect terms basically from these equations. And we collect terms what we get is following basically we have Yc plus Yd plus Yf V1 minus Yd V2 minus Yc V3 minus Yf V4 equal to zero. For example, this is, we collect terms, right? So we put, we put all the coefficients of V1 together to each other, and we can rearrange the equations. So it's something multiplied by V1 plus something multiplied by V2 and so on. Okay? We get this kind of, terms collections, okay? So we can do the same thing for each of the equations. So we get something like this. And for all the equations, we get something like this. And then finally, finally, we can get the matrix notation, okay? So this in a matrix notation is the following. If you expand this thing out in a matrix notation, what we get is YC plus YD plus YF minus YD minus Y 
C minus YF minus YB, YB plus YD plus YF, YE. YE minus YB minus YE. So you only have to do this once in this class, but for now, let's write them out. out. YB plus YC zero minus YF minus YE zero, YE plus YF plus YG. Next thing, multiply by V1, V2, V3, V4 equals to zero, zero, I3, I4. Okay, so this is our matrix notation. So after all this, what we get is Y, y times V equals to I. So Y is the emittance matrix. So this is the matrix made up by all the emittances. V is the unknown, I is the current source. Right? Or I is the current injection. Okay, so for this equation, basically the goal is, let's say if I give you current, can I solve for the voltage? Okay, if I give you current, can I solve for the voltage? So this is a linear equation. So uh, this is typed out here. This is a linear equation, right? So any question up to here? Any other question up to here? So all of this is just writing out, writing down equations and collecting terms. So the injection current is a generator, right? Uh, so right. So if the generator are, are and loads are current sources or current sinks, then each current injection current will be the generator. Right, mm -hmm. so they're not oh, they're uh, they're not in practice, but as a first step, you can imagine that the current injection or current source, so the current injections, the source or the sink, are the generator and loads. So that if you want to think that way, that's one way you can think about it. Right. So eventually we'll move on, right? So we'll move on from given current. We'll look at given power. Can you solve this equation? But for now, we'll get a linear equation. So let's think about if the current is given. Can you solve for voltage? Right? And uh, the, when we look at the network, when we do this kind of calculation, basically the first thing is we form this Y matrix, Y bus matrix. And then once we have the Y bus matrix, we get this sort of linear equation. We get a linear equation after we get the Y bus matrix. So, okay, any questions here? All right, so this is a system of n equations, right? This is a system of n equations, linear system. Okay. So it has n unknowns. We don't know the nodal voltage of n equations. So I have a solution of y is invertible. Okay, y is invertible, I have a solution, right? So in this class, we'll assume that you can, I will assume that you can, you can solve this. Okay, so I assume uh, the assumption I will make is you know how to solve an equation like y, v equals to i. Okay. You can use a computer, you probably should use a computer when you're solving this kind of equations. I encourage to use a computer to solve this. There's many ways to solve this type of equations. I mean, every linear algebra package out there has a way to solve this kind of equation. There's a linear equation. Okay, so my assumption is the question says solve this equation. It's a four by four system. Right? You're not asked to solve this by hand. Okay, you're uh, the the thing is, can you you know call a package? in whatever language you want to use to solve this equation, okay? So we look at homework, homework will say, 
This is the circuit, write down the Y bus emittance bus matrix. This is the given current injections, solve for voltage. The implied is you should use a uh, package, you should use computer to solve for this. So does anybody not have access to a software that can solve this type of linear equations? Or does anybody not know how to, uh, how to use, how to solve this linear equations? So I assuming, don't know, yeah. You, so you have not seen linear system of equations or you don't have access um, to- a I never solved any of them with any uh, software. You never solve any of them to software. Do you have access to MATLAB, something like MATLAB or Python? I have Python. You have Python, okay. Then uh, I'll suggest looking up in Python, how to solve linear system equations. Right. That's really easy. It's one, it's one line command, right? You can literally type in inverse of Y times I, that will give you the answer, mm -hmm. right? So this yeah. is really easy. We're not asking any other we're not asking for fancy things like this, right? So you have Python, there's more than enough to solve this kind of equations. Okay, cool. But okay. if you haven't done this before, I suggest looking up, uh, just Googling how to do this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so this is, so the way I'm, the reason I'm saying this is this is expected, right? So we're not gonna cover in class how to solve linear system equations. This is this. Does the school provide the MATLAB subscription? I don't think so anymore. Mm. I will check. So I'm, I'm, I know you can log in into the servers that they will have MATLAB. I don't know if you can just go and download one on your own computer and use that. However, you know, if you don't have MATLAB, you should probably, you know, you can look at Python, right? Look at Python. You can. If you need MATLAB, you're very familiar with MATLAB, you can log into the servers. But it's, yeah, so it just, so any, so most of the software will solve this kind of equations for you, but if you need, yeah, so I know for remote, you can get MATLAB. Oh, you can get it for free through so UW? Oh, okay, good. All right, so in the chat says you can download for free, uh, MATLAB is offered for free to personal things, and there's a link in chat. Okay, so yeah, if you want to use MATLAB, do that, <laughs> do that. If you want to use Python, you can use Python, you can remotely log in, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. so, but anyway, so again, I'm requiring, I'm assuming you can solve this equation. Okay, there you can, you know enough to solve equation like Y times C equals R, okay. We'll focus on solving the nonlinear version of this. We'll solve nonlinear version of this, but for the linear equations, we won't spend much time looking at how to solve this, right? So you will seem to know how to solve this. Right? So any additional questions, comments on this? Right, so, you know, I'm guessing, you know, you're familiar with either MATLAB or Python or maybe both, right? You can pick whatever one you're more familiar with. Right, so yeah, so you can solve this, right? So you'll see in homework, so it's giving equation solve it. You probably see your question in midterm, give equation solve it. Okay, so that means do not do it by hand. Okay, do not do it by hand. I would not recommend graphing calculators because typing those numbers in a graphing calculator takes a long time. And you make a mistake, it's hard to know, it's hard to do it using graphing calculator. And so you should use a computer. Right? You should make sure that you have access to a computer. Right, so I'm, right, so you can, yeah, so log into the school if you want to uh, download MATLAB, use Python, you can use Julia, use Octave, you still using that, whatever software you want. Okay, yeah, I'm assuming you can solve this, All right. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, so in practice, so this, this equation is hard to solve in practice. Because when Y matrix gets to be, you know, 100,000 by 100,000, it's not a trivial operation anymore. Memory becomes an issue, you know, inverting matrix is not feasible anymore. Solving this requires special tools. For us, we'll never get to that large of matrices. So for now, all the questions you will see is five by five as the largest. Yeah, five by, probably four by four or three by three. For that, you won't run into any issues if you just want to do straightforward matrix inversion. Okay. So it's, okay, right? 
So, what turns what turns out, y is always invertible. You can actually prove this kind of this kind of construction for y while always being invertible. Right? We won't do that proof, but there's something you can do. This is the proof you can do. So we'll now run. So the solution this says if y inverse exists, this is the solution. Turns out y inverse will always exist for a connected system. This is a uh, this is sort of not a hard proof to do. All right. So again, now check out the software. Right, download the software. Make sure you install software because in next homework you'll be asked to solve this equation. Right? So you don't want to wait until you know Tuesday next week and figure out you can install Mala or you can install Python on your computer. Right. So. Okay. All right. So okay. So basically, we solve this question. Right. Most of the time is spent on constructing this matrix. Right? We spend most of the time constructing this matrix. And uh, we did this essentially by hand. Okay? We did this by hand. So the goal is to construct this automatically and not by hand. Okay, so no software to construct this, you know, requires sort of manual input by hand. Right? We don't want to write out this by hand. So we want a sort of more or less automatic construction of the Y matrix. Okay, so let's see how to do this. So if you, if you look at this Y matrix, you should note you should notice something, right? So what is special about this Y matrix? Well, it's got symmetry. It's got symmetry, right? It has quite a bit of symmetry. It's quite a bit of symmetry. Namely, the diagonal terms as negative of this as a sum of the negative of the off diagonal terms. Okay, this is this is one symmetry we have, right? So if you write on the up, right? So this diagonal term, you don't need to look at uh, think of the diagonal term because we can write down the off diagonal terms. You directly get the diagonal, the terms on the diagonal. Right? It's a sum of the negative, okay? sum of the minus and diagonal terms. Also, for the diagonal terms, when do I have zero? Why do I have some zeros in this? When the buses aren't connected? Right, when the buses are not connected, I have zero. Okay, when the buses are not connected, zero. So if you look at this yij, if you look at this yij term in this y matrix, this equals two, right? So this equals two. Negative of the admittance between i and j. Okay, so if you look at y i j, if once you number the buses, you can do this a negative on missions between the buses. For example, this is y one two. This is a negative of the emissions between one and two. Okay, right. This is how you read it. Okay, so we don't we don't need to write out the KCL KVL balance equations like this. All you need to do is to look at the circuit and directly write this ten thing down. Minus y c comes from look at one and three. Right. This is y one three. One and three has emittance YC, so you take a negative of emittance, you put in here. Y one four. One and four is connected by YF, is negative YF, you put it here, then you write down the diagonal terms. Okay, then you write down diagonal terms. Right? So this is zero if IJ not connected. And then if you look at the diagonal term yii, the diagonal terms is negative sum of yij, right? So that's as a way of constructing this matrix. You go and you look at the emittance between any two buses. If it has emittance, you put negative of that emittance into this y bus matrix. If they're not connected, it's zero. Then you write down the sum for the diagonal elements. Okay? So this is the construction of the y bus matrix. So we don't, we will never do this again. Okay, so the goal is to never do this again. This is just a way of deriving where this matrix comes from and this to get the structure of the matrix. From now on, 
we'll look at the circuit, we'll just write down the Y matrix. Okay, we'll write down the Y matrix by inspection, okay, by looking at the circuit. Okay. So this sort of summarizes the uh, construction. Right? So it's now sort of, if you do this a couple of times, guess you, you can do this very fast. Okay, so not much mystery to this. We're just looking at the circuit diagram and writing down the corresponding uh, components in the Y matrix. Okay. Uh, professor? Yeah, but Can you talk about the Y33, how it gets uh, A, B, and C, Y, A, B? Oh, A, B, and C, okay, good, good question. So A, B, and C, so C comes from the connection to the, Why is it Y C? Right. Okay. So good. So okay. So let me be more clear. So diagonal is this plus the admittance uh, to graph. Good question. So plus the to the reference bus. All right, so this is a good question, right? So if you look at three, so minus YC is the emittance between one and three. So this is here. YB is emittance between, right? So three, three and two and three. So this is YB and YC. Then you look at this term, there's YA. YA is connected to the reference bus. So we add it to the diagonal. Okay, we add it to the diagonal. So any of the reference, anything connected to the reference bus gets added to the diagonal. Then we have zero afterwards. Okay, so this is a good question. Yeah, so in, in the diagonal terms, we have to add up the off diagonal wise plus anything to the to the reference or to the graph we have. Okay, so this YA comes from to graph. So this is the connection to reference, so we added in the diagonal terms, adding in diagonal terms. How so, the time? so yeah, so with, let me just add this, some admittance connected to the OI, so this is, right, so this is including to the reference bus. Okay, good, yeah, sorry. So how do you turn the positive sign or negative sign? So YA or minus YA? So when you look at the off diagonal terms, it's always negative. It's negative of the emittance. It's negative of the emittance, right? If you look at off diagonal terms. So for the diagonal terms, it's a summation of the emittance. Yes. Okay, so this, this is a convention, it's a convention. And the reason this comes from is just when you write out the equations, as, right? So we write out the equations, basically, we're looking at the outflow from bus one. So V1 for bus one always shows up with a positive sign. Mm -hmm. All the diagonal terms, other buses shows up with a negative sign. So this creates a sign pattern in this Y matrix. This creates a sign pattern. But, but like the Y8, like the from the ground, like the from the reference voltage. And uh, how we see that's when it's a positive. Oh, so this is positive, right? So if you look at this equation, we have, uh, for example, this is to, to the reference, right? Mm -hmm. So it's my voltage minus zero times Y8. Okay. So the positive sign comes from the fact that I'm looking at the current flow out of my node. Right, so the diagonal terms, diagonal terms are the emittance, right? You don't have to negate the emittance. The off diagonal terms minus emittance. Okay. Right, so let's, uh, so one thing we need to be very clear about is this emittance, why, right? So for example, this is a complex number. Okay, so it could have, it has real parts, it has imaginary parts. Those things could be positive or negative. So not, nothing here says the diagonal has to be positive or negative. Okay, it just is emittance. 
Well, the emittance is positive, it's positive. The emittance is negative, it's negative. Okay, right? This has, I just say you add the emittance up, but the emittance itself could have positive or negative signs, and it's a complex number anyways. Okay, so this is the thing to emphasize about. Right, so minus emittance, the total thing minus of, let's say, minus of yb could be something like, you know, one plus two j, right? So that, that number could have any sign it wants. Here, the minus sign is minus emittance. So it's minus one times the, times the emittance value. The value of the emittance is a complex number. Right? So we are, we're not saying anything about the sign of the emittance per se. We're just saying this is minus one times whatever the sign of emittance whatever yd is, okay? So it doesn't say that diagonal is guaranteed to be all positive numbers. Right? It doesn't say the off diagonal is guaranteed to be all negative numbers. It just says when you construct this matrix, you construct this way, then the, you plug in the y values, which in themselves are complex numbers. Okay. Right? any questions about this? Okay, so this is, so this nodal analysis, this works. It's basically we have a, you know, some equation that's y, y times v equals to i. So we think the current as the uh, given values as the injections. And uh, we have a voltage source. The way to deal with voltage source is basically to a Norton equivalent. Right. What you can do is you can do a Norton equivalent model, and then you can get a voltage source to a current source. Okay, this is our simple transformation. So if I have a voltage source, then seeing as a seven equivalent model, I can put this into a Norton model and get a current source. Okay. Right. So this is not very hard to do. All right. So I can handle voltage sources by this conversion of sources, right? So, okay, so we won't say much about this. If I'm assuming, you know, you have all done this kind of conversions. So we need to convert voltage to current source. Let's just say you go to each of the source, you convert them to a constant current source. So not very difficult for voltage to current sources. And then if you look at emittance between the node, between a node and a reference node, right? That was a question. So if you have a reference node, basically we can have things like shunts that shows up, right? We have shunts that show up in the, when you connect a node to the reference. We can have sources that connect to a reference. We can have load that connect to a reference. Right, so all this goes into the, the diagonal of the Y matrix, right? These are connected. If you have shunts, these are connected to the reference ground. So all this shows up uh, some connection to the common, common reference. Okay, so all together, you can again plug all them in and do this kind of construction. Okay, so all this is saying, once you get used to it, all you have to do is, you know, just look at the circuit and come up with a Y matrix. Okay. So it will turn out this Y matrix would be non-singular. Okay. Y matrix is never singular. Okay, and uh, right, ask the question that was asked that these terms connect to the ground shows up as terms in the diagonal matrix by themselves. Okay, so this is, it's actually interesting how to show this is always not single. This is an interesting graph theory. So this actually relates to linear algebra to graph theory. Okay, this relates to linear algebra to graph theory. This is not singular. So the practical significance of this matrix being not singular as it actually says the following. Once you fix a voltage reference, once you fix a voltage reference, there is a unique solution for all the other voltages. Okay, so the solution is unique. So if you're given the current injections, there is only one voltage solution that will satisfy this equation. 
If it's not singular, we're always guaranteed there is there exists one or there's only one solution. This helps a lot when we think about the system. Okay, so by the virtue of this is a linear system, we can guarantee both the existence and uniqueness of solutions because this matrix is not single. So this is actually a quite powerful statement. Okay, this is far more than just a convenience that helps us to solve linear equations. Okay, this says your system will always operate at a unique operating point when you look at it. Okay, so this uh, is quite uh, useful, quite useful for us. Okay. So sadly, if we move to the nonlinear systems, we won't have this property anymore. When we move to a nonlinear system, we're not always guaranteed there either exists a solution or the solution is unique. So often, weirdly, you know, sometimes we run into a situation in practice is we don't know which operating point we're operating at. Often that's tricky to figure out in practice. Okay? But for a linear system, at least up until now, it's always not singular, so we can always solve it. Okay? So this is quite useful for us to do. Okay? So we have a little bit more to say about the system matrix modeling, but today we'll end here. This is sufficient for us today. So thing to remember is one, how to construct the Y matrix, how to construct this Y matrix, because you will be writing down a lot of Y matrices. As we go further along in the course, we'll be looking at more and more Y matrices. If you look at homework from now on, a lot of questions will be starting off. I'll give you a circuit diagram. And the first thing you'll do is you need to write out the Y matrix, right? So in this week's homework, be some practice. I was just you know, writing down way more y matrices and solving these equations. Also, the thing to do is you know, make sure you can have some access to software that can do this sort of matrix vector calculation. Okay, we'll be doing again more and more of that as the course goes on. Okay, so the course will steadily transition more towards the programming, at least from homework's perspective, or we'll transition more and more towards programming. And the thing you should remember is when we do power engineering, much of it is actually programming. If you work for a utility, you work for a system operator, work for things like a vendor, most of the time we'll spend, you know, writing programs that does matrix calculations. Right? So you should be familiar with that. If you don't have MATLAB or you don't know Python, now is a good time to get started. Okay. All right. So we'll stop here today. Uh, next class we'll pick up from here. And we'll go into uh, nonlinear equations when things get really interesting, okay? when we don't have nice things like you know, uniqueness of solutions anymore. So that's a, we'll get into the interesting part. Right? But that's sort of built based on the fact that we can do this sort of linear equation analysis first. Okay? All right, so yeah, so any questions, uh, please ask a question about the lecture homework. Otherwise, see you on Monday. I have a question for the homework. Yeah, go ahead. This is, it's super obvious. I just want to make sure. 